Hello, and welcome back to Later Global Cultures. I'm Professor Amy Young, and today we'll explore the era of revolution and neoclassicism. But before we begin, what do you think? Are we still revolutionaries? Think of recent movements and protests. Do they harness the same spirit that early American revolutionaries had? Think about what those guys were fighting for. Are we fighting for the same things now? And what about the differing opinions on these movements? Are people who are fighting for the rights of black lives any more or less revolutionary than people fighting against abortion? Aren't they both fighting a system they disagree with? What determines which revolutions are noble causes and which are just people fighting for a personal belief? We've changed a lot since those revolutionary freedom fighters fought for representation. We're afforded a number of liberties that I think surpass anything they could have imagined. They might not have considered those things we fight for today as revolution-worthy, especially considering how splintered opinions are on whether or not things should change. Unless, of course, those early colonists were really battling for the right to protest the right to fight absolute power, or the right to be heard. In that case, no matter the shape, size, or cause, maybe we would make them proud. Today in Later Global Cultures, we'll discuss the historical and philosophical context of the late 18th century, and we'll also see if we can use this to better understand the expression of revolution and neoclassical thinkers and artists. Perhaps the best place to start, though, is to consider revolution and neoclassicism as a byproduct of the Enlightenment. And philosopher Immanuel Kant's work, What is Enlightenment?, does a pretty good job of breaking down this inspiration for us. He writes, Enlightenment is man's release from his self-incurred tutelage. Tutelage is man's inability to make use of his understanding without direction from another. Self-incurred is this tutelage when its cause lies not in lack of reason, but in lack of resolution and courage to use it without direction from another. Sapere aude, have courage to use your own reason. That is the motto of the Enlightenment. But that the public should enlighten itself is more possible, indeed, if only freedom is granted, enlightenment is almost sure to follow. For there will always be some independent thinkers, even among the established guardians of the great masses, who, after throwing off the yoke of tutelage from their own shoulders, will disseminate the spirit of the rational appreciation of both their own worth and every man's vocation for thinking for himself. For this enlightenment, however, nothing is required but freedom, and indeed the most harmless among all the things to which this term can be properly applied. It is the freedom to make public use of one's reason at every point. So, as you can see, Kant advocates for independent thinking, and moreover, he advocates for the freedom to do so. In Kant's mind, this freedom is the responsibility of the individual, and it requires a commitment to use rational thought to improve oneself and also to improve society. And he wasn't the only person starting to think this way. As we saw in the Enlightenment, rational humanism was encouraging people to look away from traditional models of understanding. It was, like Kant, encouraging people to use reason instead of superstition and facts instead of dogma. And when we saw how this resulted in scientific advancement and philosophical innovation, it also results in a systematic examination of society. Humanism, as you know, is an awareness of human greatness, and even though the thinkers in this era and in eras before were able to acknowledge human awesomeness, they looked around and saw that society was still a mess. To them, social reform and understanding should be guided by a belief in the dignity of humanity and an abiding faith in the power of reason, ideas that sometimes run counter to what monarchs and religious ideologies had taught. We've already seen some thoughts on this from John Locke, but some influential thinkers are the French philosophers Montesquieu and Rousseau. Charles-Louis Segunda, or Montesquieu, was a French judge and nobleman, and in his work, The Spirit of the Laws, he compares systems of governments in an effort to establish underlying principles and obligations of the law. In the end, he advocates for a monarchy, 
perhaps owing to his own aristocratic status, but he advocates for a monarchy where the powers are divided between kings and other bodies. Unlike Hobbes, who asserted that absolute rule was the only effective rule, Montesquieu claims that the distribution of governmental power provides an effective defense against tyrannical rule. So, yes, he sees that rationally the system in place in France is not effective, and moreover, he trusts in the rational powers of many people to check and balance one another, creating greater social stability. Then, in addition to being a contributor to the Encyclopédia, Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote The Social Contract, in which he kind of riffs on Locke's ideas, claiming that humans are essentially good and capable of reason, but society is essentially bad. According to him, the natural goodness of people had been corrupted by the growth of society, or to use his words, it's better for us to embrace our nature as noble savages, lest we become deplorable when tainted by societal stresses. Generally, this manifested as a contempt for the superficial or the artificial, as human needs for the superficial and artificial are a construct of society, and our only real needs are food, sleep, shelter, and sex, these things being bound to nature, not society. According to Rousseau, when we become slaves to our artificial needs, we become willing to dominate others to fulfill them. So, for instance, owning land is an artificial need and a societal construct. It's artificial, as no one can really own land, nor does anyone really need to, yet people will fight and die for what they believe is their right to this ownership. To him, no one's life or dignity is worth this artificial belief in ownership. In fact, he advocated for human equality and claimed that morality arises naturally when a civil state is a function of the general will of the entire community. So you can see, those ideas that began in the Enlightenment are being picked up and expanded upon by later thinkers, and when the people get a hold of them, they start to rethink their place in their own societies and what those societies should look like. The results are the American and French revolutions. The American Revolution, as I'm sure your history teachers have told you, was a rebellion against king and parliament over British taxation. See, Britain needed money to pay for past wars, and they had numerous tax schemes to get it from the colonies. The result of what were deemed unfair charges by the colonies was revolt. There were rebellions all over the colonies, and they called in alliances from France, Spain, and the Netherlands. All of these places were looking to weaken British imperial control, so they were totally on board. Bolstered by their powerful alliances and their confidence, American revolutionaries wrote the Declaration of Independence. In it, they offer an optimistic view of a new social order, one where there's political and social freedom, one where people are endowed by their creator with rights, those being life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, we know that these rights weren't really afforded everyone, but that rational humanist sentiment is there, and they're clearly borrowing optimistic points of view from Locke and Rousseau. The Declaration also calls for equality and justice, breaking from tyranny of king and parliament. In fact, the whole thing is essentially a breakup letter to Great Britain, as the Americans are tired of the empire's toxic behavior. They're tired of being neglected and taken advantage of. After they win their independence, they then draft a constitution for the newly founded United States of America. The constitution notably included civil rights that backed their revolutionary ideas, and it also included language that limited the power of government, again, borrowing from Locke and also Montesquieu. Let's take a look at that declaration and see if we can determine what they were really fighting for and how far they were willing to go to get it. The beginning of the declaration reads, When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, 
laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. So what's the tone here? Should King George feel threatened? Are they being assertive or civil? If you were the king, would you think they were making reasonable arguments and demands? King George did not think their demands were reasonable, and resulting revolution and British defeat made monarchies in other parts of the world look defeatable too. In fact, the French took some inspiration from the American colonies and set out to spark a revolution of their own. The French were upset with governmental abuses. Louis XV seemed indifferent to people's suffering, and Louis XVI added insult to the common people's injury when he put most of France's representative power in the hands of aristocrats. Meanwhile, the average person was enduring famine and cold. So yeah, the people are in a rough spot and they're getting restless. The representative government that worked with the king was called the Three Estates. The estates are made up of one, the clergy, two, the nobility, and then three, everybody else. In this system, each estate gets one vote, but the clergy and nobility notoriously vote together on almost everything, and the bigwigs win with the fewest numbers and the most money. Louis, in an effort to stave off revolution, offered to double the votes of the other estate, but they went ahead and departed and created the National Assembly and they did invite the other estates to join them. In response to their departure, the king banned them from their meeting place, and in defiance, they met on the tennis court. There they declared a tennis court oath. In it, they vowed that they would not disband until they gave France its own constitution. In most cases, their attempts after that are stifled by military action, and the military members who sympathize and refuse to act against the National Assembly are imprisoned. Then, a popular political figure and National Assembly supporter is dismissed, and this group sees this as the last straw. In retaliation, they storm the Bastille. The Bastille is a prison, and it's perhaps the most imposing structure in Paris. There they aim to release political prisoners, plus, as a bonus, the Bastille is stocked with guns and ammo, and they figure those might come in handy too. Louis learned of the Bastille the next day, and the story goes that when he asked if it was a riot, his advisor said no, it was a revolution. Then, a little later, a rumor about Marie Antoinette set the people off even more. You may have heard it. When people were suffering from famine and hadn't the resources to make bread, she supposedly said, let them eat cake, demonstrating just how out of touch she was. Current theories are that she never actually said this, but the people were still starving and they went after the king and queen. Interestingly, this group was mostly led by women, around 7,000 of them. These are the women who worked to make the little bread that was available to them stretch and feed their families. After these events, the National Assembly gathered to write the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. In this, they declared that French citizens were entitled to liberty, prosperity, security, and resistance to oppression. Ironically, this declaration spawned something called the Reign of Terror, where Maximilien Robespierre, a fervent revolutionary, aimed to establish a republic of virtue, and he instated all sorts of rules at the Constitutional Convention. Some rules included getting rid of the king and queen from decks of cards, and he converted churches to temples of reason and changed the calendar to start with the first day of the Republic. So, in more than one way, he became a totalitarian for a reason. He ended up executing peasants, nobles, workers, and revolutionaries who questioned his methods. King Louis tried to flee from Robespierre, and radical revolutionaries got a hold of him, and Louis was executed. All in all, over 16,000 people were executed by guillotine, around 2,500 in Paris and nearly 15,000 more across France. Eventually, other countries ally against the revolutionaries. I mean, the revolutionaries are looking pretty ugly with that reign of terror, and other monarchs are working against seeing such bloodbaths in their own countries. The French manage to hold them off, but they're also done with Maximilian, and they execute him. You guessed it, by guillotine. 
But before we leave France, let's take a look at their declaration, shall we? They say, the representatives of the French people, constituted as a national assembly and considering that ignorance, neglect, or contempt of the rights of man are the sole causes of public misfortunes and governmental corruption, have resolved to set forth in a solemn declaration the natural, inalienable, and sacred rights of man, so that by being constantly present to all the members of the social body, this declaration may always remind them of their rights and duties so that by being liable at every moment to comparison with the aim of any and all political institutions, the acts of the legislative and executive powers may be the more fully respected, and so that by being founded henceforth on simple and incontestable principles, the demands of the citizens may always tend toward maintaining the Constitution and the general welfare. In consequence, the National Assembly recognizes and declares in the presence and under the auspices of the Supreme Being the following rights of man and citizen. 1. Men are born and remain free and equal in rights. Social distinctions may be based only on common utility. 2. The purpose of all political associations is the preservation of the natural and imprescriptible rights of man. These rights are liberty, property, security, and resistance to oppression. 3. The principle of all sovereignty rests essentially in the nation. No body and no individual may exercise authority which does not emanate expressly from the nation. And then there are 15 additional articles. But can you see where they've borrowed ideas from the United States? What if they changed or added in? Which document do you think better states revolutionary aims? And all of these ideas find a home in the arts, too. Neoclassical arts rejected Rococo just like the revolutionaries rejected the aristocracy. And just like those rational humanists, neoclassical creators opted for dignity and austerity over frivolity and escapism. In fact, neoclassicism looks back at the restrained style of antiquity imitating ancient masterpieces because to them, those cultures with their democracies and republics were good examples of how society ought to look. Plus, they were fascinated with new archaeological discoveries as archaeologists had just unearthed Pompeii, so there was absolutely a renewed interest in Roman ideas and arts. And this awareness of classical art inspires balanced emotions and restraint in the arts, and it inspires art that calls for patriotism and liberty, this art rejected excess and it preferred gravity and order of classical forms and as such it incorporates statuesque poses, orderly decoration, primary or darker colors, and all of this is in direct opposition to Baroque and Rococo styles. Jacques-Louis David is a French neoclassicist who studied perspective, anatomy, and life drawing. He painted for Louis XVI, too, so yes, neoclassicism appealed to the monarchy, but he was a revolutionary supporter, and even though he painted for the king, he managed to depict his descent in subliminal ways. His Oath of the Horatii depicts Roman soldiers united in opposition to tyranny. Here, the Horatii brothers and their father are swearing an oath to protect the state, even though that means that they'll have to kill their sister's fiancé, who was one of Rome's enemies. In this painting, we see David's interpretation of the tension between civic duty and family loyalty. And in the work in general, he compares the values of those defending the Republic to those of the French Revolution. Louis XVI didn't get the subtext, and the painting was officially accepted and publicly displayed. To Louis, it promoted morality in France, but in reality, it's a revolutionist propaganda. And what about those neoclassical characteristics? The figures can be read from left to right, as in a classical frieze, plus there are the idealized bodies of classical art, and the figures are frozen like sculptures in serious poses. David has omitted any distracting details, and he uses horizontals, not diagonals, like the Baroque and Rococo painters did. Then, of course, there are the ties to Rome. The soldiers and the women wear Roman dress and armor, like they would have found maybe at Pompeii, and there are rounded Roman arches and serious plain Doric columns, too. And these are both features that viewers would recognize as staples of classical architecture. 
Speaking of architecture, these features from antiquity weren't only used in neoclassical painting, they were used in neoclassical architecture too. The state capitol building in Richmond, Virginia was designed by none other than Thomas Jefferson. Maybe you've heard of him. He was pretty famous. Um, he was a revolutionary who helped draft the Declaration of Independence. Then he served as governor of Virginia, then the U.S. Minister to France, and then the U.S. Secretary of State. And all of this before his term as vice president and ultimately president of the United States. But did you know that he was also a master architect? See, Jefferson disliked models of architecture at the time, and when speaking of Virginia homes, he said, it is impossible to devise things more ugly, uncomfortable, and happily more perishable. So instead of those ugly structures, he designed buildings like the one you see here. It features a classical pediment and portico, and the slightly more fancy ionic columns, and the whole structure is balanced by the astute use of perfect geometry, the symmetry of the building in the center flanked by the smaller structures on either side. And these neoclassical designs weren't just in Virginia. In fact, if you walk around Washington, D.C., you'll see the place littered with neoclassical architecture, all of it meant to convey a sense of solemnity and deference. And this sentiment found its way into the music world, too. Before this era, a popular French style of music was the style galant. It was particularly popular during the reign of Louis XV, and it was generally lighthearted music for entertainment. It was graceful and delicate and featured lots of harpsichord instrumentation, so it was basically rococo in musical form. But in the neoclassical era, classical music was born. This is in part thanks to Cristofori's invention of the pianoforte. Incidentally, he was working for the Medici family member at the time, and what he came up with was a mechanism in the harpsichord that strikes the keys with hammers rather than plucking them. This way, musicians could control the loudness of sound depending on the force with which the keys are struck. In fact, the word pianoforte means soft and strong. Anyway, this took away some of the delicacy of the music and added to the austerity of music in the neoclassical era. Now, why is it called classical music? And what do you think of when you think of classical music? Nowadays, when most people think of classical music, they're thinking of serious music for concert halls or opera houses. But in the 18th century, there was no difference between serious music and popular music. Music was meant to be listened to attentively, whether it was religious or secular, or no matter where it was being played. So the technical meaning of classical is the music that answered new musical needs in the second half of the 1700s. This music, like neoclassical arts, veered away from Baroque excess and it looked for classical qualities of balance and order. This model was brand new. It combined intellect and emotion and because there was no model from which they were reinventing, it's called classical instead of neoclassical. You may remember that while Baroque had more instruments, it still used a pretty small orchestra. It was really centered around strings and the harpsichord. The style allowed for greater improvisation by innovative composers, but it focused on emotion within related musical themes, and that was the only real organization, so to speak. The classical symphony is different because it's written for a standard orchestra. Up front, it has strings. In the middle, it has wind instruments. And in the back, it has percussion. Plus, classical music is more organized. Classical symphony has four movements. So it has more movements than a Baroque concerto. And each is carefully ordered and simpler than Baroque music. There's less polyphony and more melody. In this slide, you can see the standard orchestra layout. Notice how it's organized, but it doesn't skimp on sound. And in addition to standardizing the orchestra, the symphony was organized into what is called the sonata form. Now, be careful not to confuse this with the word sonata or a musical piece that is composed for one or two instruments. This one is all about symphonic movements. In the sonata form, there are four movements. The first is fast and complex. The second is slow and lyrical. The third is a minuet or a stately dance and the fourth offers a spirited conclusion. Each movement sets out a musical theme or a mood. 
it develops it, and then it summarizes it at the end. And generally, this is the program for all classical symphonies. Within them, there is order, clear direction, and melodic unity, unlike Baroque music that very often push the limits and vied for complexity over order. Now, Franz Joseph Haydn, or the father of symphony, spent much of his career as a court musician for a wealthy family on a remote estate. There, he was isolated from other composers and trends in music until the latter part of his long life. And because of this, he said he was, quote, forced to become original. Plus, in Haydn's public life, he exemplified the Enlightenment ideal. He was of good character, he had worldly success, he was modest and honest, and all of this added to the favorable reception of his music. Furthermore, he was prolific. He wrote over 100 symphonies in his lifetime. When you get a chance, listen to his symphony number 80 and check out the quintessential sonata form there. Also, while you're listening, try to hear how each movement is simplified and ordered so that the musical message is clear and less adorned with flourish than Baroque music is. And then there's Mozart. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart had an early musical prowess. He could play violin, piano, and had begun to compose at the age of six. Part of this surely came from the fact that his father was a musician for the Archbishop of Salzburg, and Mozart traveled with him and was exposed to a number of styles. In fact, you can almost tell where he was when he wrote pieces as he had an ear for what was stylish wherever he was staying. Nonetheless, he mastered new forms and incorporated new influences. Now, after the Archbishop died, his successor and Mozart did not get along. Mozart ended up leaving, and their parting was not friendly. Rumor has it that while Mozart was considered a genius, he was also tactless, arrogant, and had a strange sense of humor that came off as offensive to most. And his life was not an easy one. His fortunes faltered, and before he died, he was so in debt that he had to move his family to a home that most would consider below the station of a genius composer. Mozart died at an early age, too. He was only 35 when he fell mysteriously ill, and his cause of death remains a mystery. Nonetheless, he is considered a master of virtuosity. He was a conductor, a pianist, an organist, and a violinist, and he wrote sonatas, concertos, symphonies, and even operas. Be sure to check out his symphony number 40 and listen for clear, recognizable melodies. This one was composed in only eight weeks, and despite the large number of musical voices in the piece, they all seem to have a distinct melodic purpose. And also, have a listen to his Piano Sonata Number 11. This one features a complexity of mood and a recurring theme that varies slightly in each of the three movements. And that, dear friends, is a bit about revolution and neoclassicism in the 18th century. It's an era where the Enlightenment pushes the pendulum away from excess and into rational balance and order. But not to worry. The pendulum will swing again before too long. Until next time.